world's population is predicted to be 10 billion by 2050, meaning we have to feed 2.5 billion more people. And to address this, we need to increase our food production by 70%. We've also got an exploding middle class and 50% of today's populations are millennials and Gen Z who are placing new demands on the food system. Our food system is under severe pressure to produce more with less in a sustainable way and at the same time we need to reduce waste, tackle global challenges like climate change, manage scarce resources of water, land and labour and also solve for food safety and security issues. Unfortunately, we are living through the COVID pandemic Challenges in the food supply system are further exacerbated with empty retail shelves, meat packing disruptions and price increases. We're seeing acceleration of new trends where home is the new workplace, where we dine in and order food, increase engagement with digital marketplaces and look for opportunities for touchless interaction with automation and next generation farming and proteins. Now innovation in agri-food tech has become even more important and more critical and urgent. The ag tech revolution is here in the form of precision ag, big data AI, drones, control environment and next generation proteins. We can't continue to do the same things the same way. We must innovate, adopt and embrace technology. This is why we set up Thrive, to advance the future of food and agriculture through innovation. Entrepreneurs and startups from around the world can solve these problems and that is why we've built a vibrant agri-food ecosystem. Greetings from Silicon Valley. I'm John Hartnett, founder and CEO of SVG Ventures Thrive, and I would like to welcome you to our Thrive Europe Challenge. Make sure to join in today's conversation on our social channels using hashtag Thrive Europe 2021. We have an action-packed event for you today in addition to hearing from our 10 finalist entrepreneurs, we also have a stellar lineup of European investors and leaders from the agri-food industry and government. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank ICL Planet Startup Hub, our headline partner for today's event. And we look forward to hearing from their Vice President of External Innovation, Hadar Sadovsky, later in the program. Before we get started, I'd like to share some background on SVG Thrive and our motivation behind this challenge. SVG Thrive is a global investment and innovation platform based in Silicon Valley. Our vision is to advance the future of food and agriculture through innovation. We are ranked the number one most active ag tech investor in the world by Crunchbase and have also been recognized as the most valuable agri-food accelerator by AgFunder. We work with over 40 agri-food corporations and our startups have created over 1 billion in value. We have over 5,000 founders in our private network across 100 countries. Last year, we launched our Thrive Global Initiative with the US Secretary of Agriculture to solve some of the critical challenges facing our global agriculture industry and address key goals highlighted by the USDA, the European Green Deal, the US State Department, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Our mission is to identify, accelerate, and invest in innovative solutions from early stage startups that positively impact different regions of the world. We are doing this through a series of regional challenges. Today's challenge will be the fourth regional challenge and follows challenges already held in Australia, Canada, and Africa. Our Thrive LADAM challenge will take place in December. Today's winner will advance to the final of our Global Accelerator and have an opportunity to participate in our award-winning three-month program and pitch at the Thrive Forbes Ag Tech Summit in June 2022. The winner will also receive acceptance as an Extreme Tech Challenge finalist. We will also be announcing two recognition awards. The People's Choice Award, where leaders and peers in the ag community are given the chance to recognize their favorite company with their vote. And the Female Founder Award, that honors one woman whose achievements and contributions to the agri-food industry help set the standard for advancing women in technology. Our 10 finalists from Finland, Israel, Ireland, Romania, Switzerland, Spain, Sweden, the Netherlands and the UK were selected from a pool of 277 applications from across 27 countries. Special thanks to our expert judging panel from Microsoft, ICL, Baywa, Zoetis, Ornua Kerrygold and Rabobank for taking the time to participate 
and review and evaluate our finalists and helping select today's winner. It certainly wasn't an easy task and we greatly appreciate their insight and feedback. I would also like to thank our mentors for sharing their wisdom and guidance with our startups as they prepared their pitches. This is a very important part of our program and mentors can make a huge impact to entrepreneurs as they embark on their journey. Now, I'd like to share a short video from our headline partners, ICL Planet Startup Hub, before I have the pleasure of welcoming VP of External Innovation, Hadar Sadovsky, for a discussion on sustainability and open innovation. Today, everything, and I mean everything, must be cool. People, cool. Products, cool. Cars, dogs, companies, even companies. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, take ICL. We're big. Huge. A massive company. Is that cool? A century of experience. Cool? Dozens of sites worldwide. Is that cool? What about some of our recent developments? Industry 4.0 technologies. Next generation fertilizers. A digital platform for agronomists. How about turning waste into valuable products? Important is a cool though. Magnesium deodorants for athletes. Organic fertilizers. Green energy storage. Hydrogen fuel cells. Meatless meat. Is that cool enough for you? You know what? We don't care about cool because cool doesn't matter. What does matter is the future. What matters is feeding the planet and making sure humankind has what it needs to flourish. We challenge, we imagine, we innovate. We don't care about cool. We're here to shape the future. Welcome to our Fireside Chat, and I'm delighted to be joined by Hadar Sadowski, Vice President of External Innovation at ICL Group, one of the top tier corporates in the field of agriculture, food, and engineered materials. Hadar brings a wealth of experience from innovation, investment, sales, marketing, and scientific approaches to establishing and managing the ICL Planet Startup Hub, which is the vehicle which ICL invests and works with innovative startups in crop nutrition and food domains. Welcome, Hadar. Hey, John. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, SVG Ventures and Thrive Events. Really, it's a really a pleasure to be here. Excellent. L love to chat uh, about uh, ICL and, and what you're doing. And maybe to kick us off, we've got a, an international audience here today. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about uh, ICL and the Planet Startup Hub and maybe your role there as well. Sure, I would love that. So again, I'm very excited to be here. It's the first time actually I'm taking a live part in this event and I'm happy to, to have uh, ICL Planet as the headline uh, partner. It, it makes us everybody in the team very happy and proud. Uh, so a little bit about ICL. ICL actually, it's, it's a... It's a leading group in, in specialty minerals. Uh, we create solutions that are actually uh, going to uh, uh, industries like food, agriculture, and other industrial markets. So uh, if, if we look at the value chain, so ac actually ICL leverages unique uh, capabilities in mining bromine. We are the leaders, number one in the world in bromine, in potash and in phosphate resources. And from that can come all the, our great success. Um, the company is, uh, is uh, listed, uh, dually listed in the New York Stock Exchange and uh, in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Uh, we have nowadays more than 12,000 people working worldwide in ICL. And by the way, all of them have, have uh, chosen ICL as their employer of choice. It was uh, actually, we are third year in a row, you are just getting our indexes higher and higher on, on being an employer of choice. Uh, in 2020, our revenue reached up, up to uh, $6 billion. Um, I have to tell you as well, since we are in the European challenge and the uh, sustainability is part of the uh, very focal uh, part of the challenge, 
that ICL is ranked and rated in many of the ESG indices like Bloomberg ESG and Bloomberg 2020 GEI. We are third a year in a world being selected and highly ranked. Um, two weeks ago, actually, we got uh, selected to get a sustainable sustainability linked loan in about uh, $250 million. So it's actually a continuous part of our, our focus on ESG uh, practices. Uh, from my side, uh, my role is uh, being uh, the VP of external innovation. I joined ICL uh, only nine months ago. So I'm pretty new in, in the organization. There are people there working more than 20, 30 years. Actually, it's a place that everybody calls home. You know, I arrived and I tried just to understand the organization and understand who are the people, what do they do? And everybody was smiling when I arrived, embracing my onboarding. It was a, a, pleasant, a pleasant surprise getting to an organization like a corporate and getting this kind of a warm welcoming. So um, I come from a, a VC a, a background. I was a, a managing partner in Aqua Agro, a VC a fund that was investing in agriculture, in uh, sustainable solutions for food tech and clean tech and water solutions. In this fund, I established a lot of uh, impact investing practices. And all of this experience I bring to uh, my new role in ICL. I recently established ICL Planet. ICL Planet, as you said, would be the vehicle in which ICL would do early stage investments in the areas of ag tech and food tech which are uh, the new uh, growth engines for, for the company. And this is what I'm trying to do. Excellent. Well, that's, that's a lot. And in nine months, <laughs> that's a, a, short, a short period of time. And I try time. to make it short. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's incredible. I mean, the scope of the, of the company and uh, great to hear the focus on, on, on sustainability. You know, why, why the uh, set up an ag tech, food tech accelerator arm? And, you know, why now? And... Also, maybe if you could, you know, maybe tell our audience a little bit about how you can help those companies beyond capital. Obviously, most startups are uh, focused on raising money, but, you know, the access uh, to other parts of, uh, of the business is super important as well. Yeah, so, so uh, all this comes from actually a, a transition that ICL uh, started two years ago and it's still ongoing. So I arrived, as I told you, only nine, nine months ago, but the, the organization is, is in transition. We got to the point where we understand that we are not alone in the world and each action that we do has consequences on everything and lives on the planet. So, so uh, a key, key milestone in, in, in our business transformation was centered around the idea that of responsibility of the collective future. So understanding that and based on that, I started thinking about what would be the model of this vehicle, of this investment arm. And this is how the inception of, of uh, ICL Planet started. So, but it's not, it's not in a vacuum. It comes as part of a transition. Uh, when I arrived, I saw that the whole company is actually doing innovation already internally and externally so we were producing solutions already uh, and innovating in in alternative proteins so our food business unit which is part of the specialty phosphate actually is already producing alternative proteins um, so the r d itself is growing into the new trends of the world the new sustainable trends of the world so um, this is one and then I saw that there is a, a full division doing a, a operational excellence, uh, trying to, to uh, make all our processes better, if more efficient, more sustainable. And these guys, I'm telling you, they are doing AI for predictive maintenance, uh, 3D printing, uh, using drones and robotics only for maintenance of the facilities and the process of manufacturing. On top of that, when I arrived, it was the end of the year of innovation. It seems like internally, and all of us from the outside, we don't see what's going on inside. It's a whole culture of innovation. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, there is a, a, an internal accelerator only for employees where all the employees are incentivized 
to bring out new ideas, new innovative, destructive ideas in how to make things better. And they pitch it and they get funded by the management. So it's amazing, you know, you get innovation part of your KPIs. Won't you innovate? For sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's the culture I arrived in. And this is how I thought, okay, they're doing this internally. And then there was already a, an, an active open innovation unit. So I took charge, charge on that. And I saw that they were only collaborating and funding POCs only. It's not only, it's a lot. I mean, it's mm -hmm. so much, it's, it's a lot of support to, to give to researchers in the academy. So we were funding a project with the university. And in the other extreme, we were just buying companies that would make our, our presence in the, in the leading market better. But in the middle, in the early stage interactions between this large corporate and startups, we didn't have anything. So I thought, okay, we are focusing on early stage startups. We are going to offer money, but money is not enough. So what else do inter does a, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur needs? He doesn't need only money. He needs to collaborate to do a pilot or to do a go-to-market process with, a, with an organization that knows the market, that can give him tools, that can give him a dialogue, a constructive dialogue. So the idea is that ICL Planet would give funding for equity. So we are doing active investment in early stage startups, but mm -hmm. only startups that are pilot ready or market ready. And then what we do is add on a process. So we have two tracks, a process of pilot. So we give funding and then the full infrastructure of whatever a startup would need and a pilot process or a go-to-market process with our business units. So if you are an entrepreneur, once we are finished with you, I mean, once we do the journey, your uh, investor deck would never look the same. You will go out with a strategic partner, which is ICL, tick the box. And then you will have a successful pilot or a successful go-to-market process, check the box. Mm -hmm. So from here, you just need to go and do the follow-on round. And I'm not saying I'm not going to be uh, co-investing because I might do that or I might acquire the company later on. So we have a spectrum of opportunities if you join us. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the beauty of, of the value proposition I'm trying to create, to make an attractive value proposition for talents. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for new ideas. I'm looking for talents. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the key yeah. uh, uh, idea here. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, obviously, the whole culture of the company is, is very much an innovative culture. And uh, great, great to hear that. And, you know, I think it's so important for for startups to get that that value because you know there's so much fixation on getting the investment when really the access to you know your labs proof of concept being able to reach new customers and the credibility that ICL brings to a young startup is uh, is is very very powerful that's gr great to hear that i know that yeah. innovation you know is very much linked to sustainability and sustainability is on the top of everybody's agenda uh, right now and how do you link, you know, your open innovation strategy to sustainability? And I know one of the tough things to do is how do you measure that, or how do you measure, you know, you know, success around that? How do you how do you approach that? Yeah, that's that's a, a terrific question because I think all this the, this space is evolving as we speak. I mean, at the beginning, no one knew what's the connection between social responsibility. SDGs, ESGs, GRIs, I mean, so many names, so many methods, what are we going to do? And at the beginning, it was just, just a philanthropic uh, uh, organizations that were doing that, but it's not the case right now. So what I'm trying to do is actually, uh, I come from an investment fund, as I told you, and I implemented their impact investing practices. So what I, what I said when I arrived, Whatever vehicle I'm going to establish, I'm going to implement some impact investing practices and disciplines on top of that. So it's another layer of, of, uh, of activity. Um, what do I mean? I mean, what is impact investing uh, anyway? I mean, the idea here is 
looking at a double bottom line. So this is what we are doing. I'm not going to look only on the ROI, only on my financial gain in this strategic investment. What I'm going to do is look at the bottom, at the double bottom lines, both the, the financial and then the positive environmental impact that this investment in this technology or these startups would do. Mm -hmm. So there are a few core um, 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 principles or characteristics that are important in impact investment. And one of them, and the first one is intentionality. I mean, you don't measure anything yet. Just have the intention, you know, I, I practice yoga. And when we enter the room, we just sit and we just, focus on the intention. And here it's the same. I mean, when we are screening and choosing and doing due diligence, part of the indicators that I'm looking at, of course, the team and the IP and the technology and how unique is it and what would be the market leadership after it, after, uh, but I'm also looking at what is the intention mm -hmm. to create a positive environmental impact. impact. Later on, once I did the investment, I am adding the second, the second and the third characteristics, which are profitability and measurement. So, and of course, reporting. So what we're going to do is work with each one of the startups that we are going to invest in, like we are impact investors. First of all, choosing according to intentionality, mm -hmm. later on understanding and giving them and adding on to the business strategy and impact strategy, which is not detached mm -hmm. from the business strategy, which is mm -hmm. tailored and part of the business strategy. So impact and business strategies are going to go together mm -hmm. as a shared value. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to find out what is the best indicators to choose because it could be tailor-made. And we are going to teach them and create a methodology on how to measure it and create a, a method on how to report it. So on a portfolio level, I will be able to tell my management and also the rest of the investors out there what is the positive uh, uh, environmental impact that my portfolio does because i'm going to measure it and i'm going to be able to report it mm. same same thing for the startups that is going to uh, uh, be an alumni of my mm. of the process with me i mean they're going to have a pilot a strategic investor and also their own report on what is the uh, positive environmental impact they are going to do or they are already doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very, uh, uh, it's very methodological. And of course, each one of the, the indicators is going to be quantitatively linked on how it contributes to the SDGs. Mm -hmm. So that's the part, there are methodologies for that and we are going to work on that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, excellent, I think. Um... You know, obviously the focus on sustainability is great, but really being able to measure the impact is difficult. And having that approach at the start, I think is is really powerful stuff and linking it to the SDGs. You know, we're obviously delighted to have ICL as our headline partner for our European challenge. And, um, you know, I mean, this is a big initiative. Uh, we've had huge amount of interest from startups from all across uh, Europe, and we're delighted to have ICL, you know, participate. What attracted you to this uh, initiative? And then also, what do you think about the quality of European entrepreneurs? And by the way, we're very uh, impressed by Israel, Israel entrepreneurs. They're some of the best <laughs> in the world. So it's great to get your perspective. Yeah, so so first of all, I think if, if uh, I, I just uh, relate to Thrive and, and all this global initiative, I think one of the things that was very attractive is that it's global. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, it solves problems that are global. And, and, uh, and if, if you look at the European challenge, so it really focuses on solving uh, European agri-food industry uh, uh, challenges and accelerate uh, pro, uh, companies in these ecosystems. Uh, what I like the most is the close connection and the alignment to the Green Deal. Mm. This gives a lot of, um, uh, validity 
to even doing this kind of a challenge. I mean, it's not detached. It's not just want to be more of the same kind of challenge. It's really aligned with something that is written and all of us are like uh, aligned to the same uh, to the same challenge and to the same purpose. Um, I know that, that the key challenge in Europe is, is actually uh, boosting the entrepreneurship and shifting the perception on increasing more recognition for, of entrepreneurs. And I know that the EU is, is really uh, uh, putting a, a lot of effort on doing that. And one of the objectives is really creating more, uh, more uh, not only supporting the entrepreneurs, but also creating more jobs mm -hmm. and creating more innovative uh, companies. So, so I think that the Thrive actually, by doing this, by opening this European platform is contributing to exactly that because it's, it is providing the, the vital ingredients to foster uh, this kind of entrepreneurial activities, you know, ensuring uh, access to finance and access to customers and access to new markets and, and enhancing business skills. This is uh, priceless. Yeah. Uh, if we tapping into the question of how are we work, I know everybody talks about the Israeli entrepreneur, but let's talk, let's talk about the whole. Talk about the, the European entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. What I, I, I really, I rate them high in, in their awareness on tapping into the real challenges of the world and humanity. Mm. It's not just doing money for money or just uh, give, uh, bringing another application, another high-tech company. What I feel is that in Europe, there is more uh, strong awareness on, on, on really uh, uh, overcoming global societal challenges uh, that are part of our climate change and all the sustainable energy and food and healthy living struggle that we see and we want to solve. And I think that in Europe, it's something that people and mostly entrepreneurs are more aware of. And, and this, is, this is fascinating. And I would love to support that more and this is one of the reasons I really joined the European challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is where we can tap in and really align with, with the values that we want to create. Mm -hmm. That's ex excellent and, and really refreshing as well to kind of hear, hear that, uh, that, that approach. And, um, you know, my last question is, uh, is, I guess, looking into the crystal ball of the future. And maybe you have to wear your yoga hat here. Uh, <laughs> You know, are you optimistic, you know, that we can transition our food systems to a more sustainable practice uh, and meet some of these climate goals, you know, on time? Uh, yes, I am. First of all, we have to keep optimistic. And second, we are players in the agriculture and food. And we are players, I mean, a high end. We are creating more solutions. So it's not that... We are part of the solution. If I'm not going to be optimistic, who will? I mean, we are the, the leaders of this transition. We have to be optimistic. I mean, we need to produce 50% more food in order to eliminate malnutrition uh, to, to, to humanity. We need to cut like uh, 13 gigatons of, of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So we have a lot on our plates. You have to agree with me on that, yeah. right? So, so what we're trying to do is, is really focus on how to, and maybe collaborate. I mean, it's not a one-man show here. Collaboration and maybe uh, more sharing um, in, in finding these, these opportunities that will create better food, low carbon food, healthy food, more sustainable food. I mean, it's all part of the same value chain and we are all players on the same game here. So yeah, I see opportunities in, 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 in precision ag agriculture and in, in a lot of like data-driven support, uh, decision support system uh, solutions. I mean, just last year, ICL bought a, a startups in, in the US called Growers, which provides this kind of a solution to the farmer, a decision support platform. Amazing. I mean, this is the kind of things we want to be part of. So yes, we went and we acquired a company. 
-hmm. and and one of the other areas that I see a lot of opportunity is maybe alternative proteins. Um, it's something that we have to to shift to to this kind of nutrition and this kind of production. Uh, for that matter, what 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 is guiding our strategy in food is is uh, uh, maybe let's say clean label. What we're trying to do is replace all. We have we have a unit that is actually selling B 2 B ingredients for the food industry, but we also, as I told you before, already creating uh, alternative protein solutions, and we are selling that as well. Mm-hmm. But lately, uh, we announced it in July, we invested in a young uh, startup named Forterra Bioscience. Amazing, brilliant guys, a guy and a girl from, from Chile that uh, have, have uh, founded a startup named Proterra, which is an AI-based platform to design and to produce a, a alternative a proteins that are functional. So in our view, what we want to do is replace all the functional chemical molecules in the food industry in mm-hmm. functional proteins that okay. come from, the, from plant sources. Mm-hmm. So this is why we did this investment. And this is the, the, the line of action that we are trying to lead. And this is why we're here, because this yeah. is what we're looking for. Yeah. Well, that's, that's excellent. And a really great to kind of end on that uh, optimistic you know, view. I think it's been fascinating kind of listening to you, Hadar, and just chatting around you know, the focus on innovation, not just internally, but externally. And, and the work that you're doing um, is really, really powerful stuff, obviously. We've got big challenges ahead with, you know, climate and, you know, the sustainability goals that we're trying to achieve. But uh, it's very, very refreshing to be able to hear and chat with you about what ICL are doing and the ICL Startup Planet Hub. So well done and all the the great work in the last nine months and uh, (laughs) wish you best for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Let's have a good event. And I'm looking forward to see all the startups and the challenge and see who is going to win. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's wish them the best and uh, hope the winner is going to be great. Take okay. care. See you later, John. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to our panel, The Green Deal and its Opportunity for our Agriculture. And I'm delighted to be joined here by Minister Martin Hayden, Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine in Ireland. He was appointed with special responsibility for research and development, farm safety and new market development. He was also a member of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Climate Action, which produced a cross-party report on climate action. Welcome, Minister Hayden. Uh, Thanks, John. Thanks very much. Good to be part of this. I'm also honored to be joined by Mark Ferguson, Mark is chair of the European Innovation Council. He is also director general of Science Foundation Ireland and chief scientific advisor to the government of Ireland. As an inventor and an entrepreneur, he co-founded a rapidly growing European biotech company. Mark, great to see you again and thank you for joining us. Thanks, John, looking forward to it. Likewise. Maybe just to kick things off for both of you um, and maybe we can start with Minister Hayden first. The European Green Deal is a strategy set out by the European Commission in 2019, and it is striving to make Europe the first climate neutral continent. And agriculture, farm to fork, is one of the eight focus areas with its own goal supporting food loss prevention and sustainable food production, processing, distribution and consumption. What are the European Innovation Council and Irish government doing to contribute to advance these goals, Minister? Uh, thanks, John. Look, first of all, thanks very much to you and your Tribe AgTech team for the opportunity to participate in this panel as part of the Tribe Europe uh, Challenge event. This event is timely as it offers me an opportunity to speak to you about developments involving my department that address both our national goals and objectives for the agri-food sector that is laid out in our programme for government. Um, and these developments in turn are aligned with the EU Farm to Fork strategy as part of delivering on the EU Green Deal. Um, And the key part of that is our Food Vision 2030. Uh, This summer, along with my government colleagues, we announced Food Vision 2030 strategy, which is a new 10-year strategy for the agri-food sector. Um, And this vision is for Ireland to become a world leader in sustainable food systems 
delivering significant benefits for the Irish agri-food sector and society, including our environment and climate. This vision uh, indeed will provide us the basis for the future uh, competitive advantage of the sector based on addressing key environmental and climate targets. So if I can just maybe expand on the Food Vision uh, 2030 strategy by outlining the four missions um, that are, are at the heart of it really, you know, we have environment and climate, uh, viable and resilient primary producers, which is a key part of this, um, uh, safe, nutritious food and innovation. Um, and each of those four pillars uh, are, are four missions are absolutely key because Food Vision 2030 recognizes that the transition to a sustainable and circular food system is a key component of climate action and to ensure prosperity and welfare in rural areas. So um, it, it commits as well the strategy, uh, my department to work across government with other stakeholders to meet a lot of very ambitious targets, uh, namely to reduce biogenic methane by at least 10% by 2030, uh, subject to the climate action plan negotiations uh, that are ongoing at present, to reduce our emissions associated with chemical fertilizer use by more than 50% by 2030 reduce nutrient loss uh, from agriculture to water by 50% by 2030, uh, have 10% of farmed area prioritized for biodiversity spread across all farms throughout the country, target at least 7.5% of utilizable agricultural area farmed organically by 2030, and develop a national food waste uh, prevention roadmap delivering reductions to have our per capita food waste by 2030 and promote our transition to a circular economy. So this is about you know, our farmers, our food companies, um, they're already taking steps to understand the need for sustainable and circular food systems and how this will impact on their uh, business model. Uh, my department, our partners and uh, our government aim to strongly support our farmers and the agri-food companies in this transition through the CAP, uh, through research and innovation and through nationally funded sectoral programs. That's excellent, uh, Minister. Very ambitious goals there and uh, great, great to hear that. Such a comprehensive uh, strategy. Thank you. Mark, you know, from a European Innovation Council, you know, perspective, um, can you share a little bit more about what you're doing there? Absolutely, John. So thanks for the opportunity to participate in this great event. Uh, to follow on from the minister, I mean, we work closely with the minister's department in Ireland. And for example, through challenge based funding, have just funded uh, work to address the first carbon neutral farm in Ireland that will hopefully spread out. And that's a sort of segue into the European story. The European Innovation Council is really about helping companies start and scale in Europe and getting them to address really important questions, societal questions such as climate action, sustainable food supply, uh, managing uh, the environment and so on. And so a focus has been on the green agenda. It's been on agri-tech. I think agri-tech offers huge opportunities for entrepreneurs. I mean, everything from whether it's uh, CRISPR-based technology in plants through to sensors and multiple deployment, through to apps to help uh, farming, through to you know, ways in which you can manage your carbon budget, ways in which you can take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So these really skilled entrepreneurs in Europe, they need financing and they need connections. And the European Innovation Council provides, for example, up to 2.5 million in a grant and up to 15 million in equity. We really want to work with partners. We're all about crowding in. So we're working with national governments, with private sector from all over the world. And then of course, organizing corporate days and investor days for those companies uh, to uh, pr present essentially to the supply chain. And I mean, in Thrive, you do an absolutely terrific job and we're really uh, interested in working with partners like yourself to make sure that those really innovative companies can grow and scale and, you know, what could be better than addressing really important societal needs like food production and having a greener environment and making money and providing employment at the same time? It's a fantastic mm -hmm. combination. And that's what we're there to catalyze. That's uh, fantastic, Mark. And I, I, it's been a mission of ours as well, you know, to advance the future of food and agriculture through innovation. And you know, we certainly see entrepreneurs very much changing the world in every area. And I think this is fantastic to hear what the European uh, innovation Council are doing to stimulate that and help uh, entrepreneurs. So excellent, excellent stuff there. Minister, you know, again, maybe going back on the technology side, could you give us a, a little bit more in terms of the role of technology in Irish agriculture and how do you see investment in new innovations under the New Horizon Europe programme actually making things better for farmers and end users? 
Yeah, thanks, John. Um, well, look, I mentioned the four missions in Foodwise 20, in Food Vision uh, 2030, uh, and under the innovation mission, we set out a clear goal to enhance the use of technology and data by providing opportunities for upskilling um, and to take up technology using CAP funding, uh, to examine co-investment between public and private sector for ag tech accelerator programs, to address the potential social and economic impact of technology, particularly in relation to data governance. Um, and then the rapid rollout of our national broadband plan, which is a really ambitious plan here in Ireland, where government is going to deliver free high speed fibre broadband to every home premises um, and business in the country. Um, and to ensure that that happens as quickly as possible, because that will be a, a game changer for us and for mm -hmm. us balanced regional development into the future. Um, we already know that Irish farmers are strongly engaged in the use of data and technology on a daily basis. So there's a couple of examples there, you know, breeding for genetic gain in our dairy, beef and sheep um, enterprises. We have grass measurement um, from Chagas have a pasture-based system. We have nutrient management planning from um, Chagas as well, have an online system. And that first breeding for genetic gain is uh, something that our Irish Cattle Breeding Federation, um, you know, have developed. And I know as part of the Thrive Europe Challenge that two Irish companies have emerged in the final group of contestants. And this is an example of an emerging agri-tech and agri-digitalization community that is present in Ireland at both commercial and research level. And uh, this community reflects the strong cross-government approach from not only my department, but also uh, very significantly Science Foundation Ireland and Enterprise Ireland in developing the role of technology and data use in Irish agriculture, as Mark has kind of touched on there earlier as well. And I expect with a, a rounded approach addressing both technology development and governance concerning data use, this community will grow even stronger. Mm -hmm. That's great. Very good, Minister. And I know we share the same challenges in terms of broadband connectivity across rural areas, you know, worldwide, but obviously we're suffering here in the US as well. So it's great to see that that plan to, to, to drive and accelerate that forward, because I do think it's a, it's key to be able to power up um, farms around around Ireland. Uh, and Mark, maybe, you know, some of us know about the European Innovation Council, but it is, you know, relatively a new initiative. Could you tell us a little bit more about the vision, the strategy and how it plans to catalyze uh, investment into agri-tech agri companies? Sure, John. So, I mean, basically, Horizon Europe is the European Commission's largest R&D program. It's one of the largest R&D programs in the world. It has three pillars. The first is about the European Research Council, which is about fundamental research. The second is about challenges. And the third pillar is about innovation. And the main component of the innovation pillar is the European Innovation Council. The budget is about 10.2 billion euros uh, mm. spread over five years. And there are essentially three programs. Pathfinder, which is really about trying to identify cutting edge new technologies for the future. For those of you from the US, it's a bit like DARPA. It's a European DARPA, it's top down. It's looking at really important uh, challenges such as agri-tech, uh, such as you know, use of artificial intelligence, quantum and so on. And that's about grants, usually for consortia, uh, typically universities and companies uh, within Europe. The second program is transition. That's what it says on the tin. Uh, basically, if you've got a fantastic research idea that's come out of say the European Research Council or it's come out of a challenge fund or it's come out of a national fund and you wanna transition that into a business, then you can get a grant which is up to two and a half million euros. And for those from the US, that's a bit like SBIR. Mm -hmm. And then the third pillar, which is really unique is about blended finance. And that's the accelerator program and that's called Accelerator. Um, and basically that's blended finance. So you can get up to 2.5 million euros in a grant and up to 15 million euros equity. So that's 17.5 million euros in total. That's only for small companies. It's for single companies in Europe and it's really to help them grow and scale. And what we really wanna do is we want to crowd in investment. So we want to invest in high risk companies, not stupid risk companies, but high risk companies. We want to de-risk it for the private sector. We want to work with the private sector. Uh, we get about a thousand applications a month. Um, and that's really to try and grow and scale those companies in deep tech. And as I said before, the Green Deal is a real focus for us. So is digital, uh, so is climate action and so on. And basically, it's grant plus equity. Uh, and that equity is about crowding in. We really want 
to get the private sector to come in to back these companies. I mean, my vision is we make ourselves redundant. We, we don't need 10 billion in five or 10 years time. The private sector will be so enthusiastic about all the great companies coming out of Europe that we will not be necessary. And I really hope that that happens. In addition uh, to the Grant Plus Equity, we have corporate days where we link companies with uh, appropriate corporates, either for supply chain or investment. We have investor days. And we also work with the European uh, Institute of Technology to really help mentor companies. And that's particularly important in the new countries that have joined the European Union, the former Eastern Bloc countries, where there's fantastic technology. But, for example, sometimes the way in which the business plans can be written or people are mentored, they need a bit of help and assistance. So we're really trying to do that. We also have some top-down initiatives. Everything's bottom-up, but we also have top-down initiatives, particularly for female entrepreneurs, uh, particularly for uh, entrepreneurs from less developed regions, and that's typically rural regions. And then often we have a thematic call. We had a thematic call in the Green Deal. We have a thematic call for COVID. We funded uh, over 200 million into COVID-related companies within a month. Um, and the idea is not to be bureaucratic. So I describe the European Innovation Council as being like a mutant. It does not have the bureaucracy that you commonly associate with large government organizations. It's about the private sector. It's like a business plan. It's pitching in front of uh, a group of panelists. It's about getting uh, the uh, decisions made in a very timely fashion. It's about deal flow. Uh, and it's about real high quality. So that's what we're trying to do. Think of it as a kind of yeah. mixture between SBIR and DARPA with a European flavor. Yeah, excellent, Mark. That's great. And uh, again, a, a phenomenal initiative. I mean, 10 billion is a, a significant uh, you know, in investment. And um, we're already working with the team in Europe as well. And, you know, it's great to see that engagement. And I think the European, you know, corporate days and workshops, I mean, these are very powerful. Many companies and startups definitely didn't need funding, but access to customers and corporates is, is hugely important. So that's that's great to, great to hear. Uh, Minister, I mean, obviously, you know, things are, are challenging in some respects in terms of the adoption of technology for farmers. You know, significant barriers include trust that uh, new solutions would provide either a return on investment or the upfront cost is, uh, ex is expensive uh, versus the risk of failure. And data privacy concerns, you know, are a few of the key challenges we hear from farmers. Um, what's your plan to support and facilitate and maybe accelerate the adoption of new technology and solutions in the farms of uh, Ireland? Yeah, well, John, look, we're very conscious of the feedback from farmers uh, that there are numerous challenges, um, as you've identified there, for the uptake of technology and better use of data. Um, our Irish Farmers Association, one of our largest farm representative bodies, uh, have clearly identified these challenges in their digital adoption survey uh, with Irish farmers. And in response to that, we have been working with government partners on a digital adoption training program for farmers as a response. Um, so details in this program will emerge in due course, but we're very conscious that we will have agri-digital adopters um, who will require training and upskilling at various level of understanding, and we will focus on meeting the needs of the farming community. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Mark. Or thank you, Minister. Mark, um, in terms of sustainability, I mean, there's a growing saliency of sustainability day by day. We hear it, you know, every day in terms of, you know, some of the challenges we're facing quite a bit over here in terms of you know, wildfires, et cetera. And it's, it's a worldwide uh, uh, area of, of challenge, but also of opportunity. Um, have you seen a change in investment trends and innovation within your network uh, across Europe? And, and what does it mean for agri-food startups? Yeah, we've certainly seen a big change. I mean, customers are demanding goods be more and more sustainable. So what that means is, you know, uh, that many, many businesses, both existing businesses and new businesses are uh, focusing on trying to meet that need. So examples are, you know, people addressing the circular economy. Uh, recycling uh, is a big uh, area. So recycling different forms of plastic, recycling, for example, renewable batteries, uh, rechargeable batteries, quite important for the future, all sorts of recycling. Then you see ways in getting carbon capture uh, and utilization. So not just carbon capture and storage, but utilization. So the agri-tech business ha has a role there, for example, plants with deeper and more widespread root systems that make the plant both resilient 
to swings in the climate, that's whether it's drought or flooding, but at the same time capture carbon and put it into the soil and then you plow it up and so on. So you can see that, you can see industries looking at CO2 as a catalyst, a starting material for making uh, substances that tends to be bio-based. So it tends to be uh, genetically engineered microbes that are using CO2 instead of sugar. And if you think about it, there's never been a pressure to use CO2 as a catalyst before, but now that people are paying you to take CO2 away from an industrial process or out of the atmosphere, there's a business mm -hmm. there. Um, mm -hmm. And then you're seeing all kinds of stuff in terms of reuse, uh, reutilization of materials. So there's a fantastic array of things. I mean, I am actually very optimistic. Science uh, uh, can address the serious societal need which is our ability to use the planet more sustainably and to manage carbon dioxide uh, more carefully. But there's fantastic innovations coming through and there are businesses. And I believe that people will grow really important big businesses. I mean, if you think about it, the big digital businesses of the, of the present time are largely about advertising and communication. So, you know, it's fantastic. We can send photographs to each other over the internet, but wouldn't it be fantastic if we have similar companies that are addressing societal needs? So I think we can grow businesses that are just as big as the current players, but are addressing really important questions uh, of uh, managing the climate, of uh, supplying food, of doing things in a more sustainable way. Lots mm -hmm. of opportunity. Science yeah. is fantastic. Opportunity is huge. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, Mark. And maybe a, a last question for both of you around maybe the two key stakeholders in all of this. Um, you know, are there unique challenges that European entrepreneurs face and what can be done by you and other leaders to help agri-food entrepreneurs overcome these barriers? And maybe the other key stakeholder is, the, is a farmer. You know, what do you see as the biggest problems facing the farmer today, um, Minister? Well, thanks, uh, John. Yeah, look, it's a good question um, because, you know, there are unique challenges, um, as you've outlined there. And one point is that, I suppose, from the European entrepreneurs, the challenges they face, that there is a difference in the maturity and scale of the Silicon Valley investment ecosystem versus the European investment ecosystem. Um, and how to respond to this difference is a key challenge. And Europe is developing a response to this gap through the, Europe, for example, the European Innovation Council that Mark has been speaking about. Um, and one other point is, uh, that is more agri-food sector focused is um, on the EU common agricultural policy is a more regulated system than in other jurisdictions. So European entrepreneur, entrepreneurs need to align with this regulated system in the development of European relevant technologies. And the EU agri-food system requires European entrepreneurs to gain experience on legislation, regulations and supports. Uh, from the agri-food entrepreneur side, um, you know, one clear action is that my department is very open to coordination and collaboration with entrepreneurs and to guide them to examine Horizon Europe finding opportunities. Um, and my department and this government are also very open to engage and consult with stakeholders and to examine any perceived barriers and to seek out solutions uh, where, where issues are identified and uh, need to be addressed. Um, I suppose the biggest problems facing farmers then today, it's it's necessary for agriculture to undergo a really significant transition uh, to address environmental and climate challenges and you know income and the, the price they get for their produce um is also a really significant uh, challenge for them so and that's something we need to bear in mind um in, in terms of you know probably that we, we live in a in a low cost uh, food environment that is a challenge for them as well and trying to face all the challenges they face but in overall terms my department and government aims to support our farmers and our agri-food sector in their journey and undertaking the changes that are necessary and a key part of that food vision uh, 2030 is that you know the sustainability of our not just the environmental sustainability of our food production but the economic sustainability of our farmers to do that and the societal uh, sustainability that it is for our farmers to remain economically viable um, in their in their rural communities so that we have that balanced regional development in our country so a key challenge will be to support our farmers and companies to take up innovation and to upskill to prepare for future sustainable food systems uh, required because I think that's um, that is the way forward and there's, there's value added in that for them as well and, and for the agri-food sector in general. Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you, Minister. Mark, same question for you. 
So I would agree with what the minister has just said. I mean, clearly uh, financing startups I've spoken about earlier. Also the market, you know, Europe is a collection of separate uh, countries. Uh, it's not a single market like the United States. Uh, so, so again, getting into that market. Procurement is also very important, particularly when it comes uh, from government. So in addition to what the minister has said, let me just say that I think there's another side to that. And that is that I have seen farmers be very, very responsive. I've seen them be in really engaged in programs. And there's a real necessity, for example, in research programs to engage those farmers. So in our challenge-based funding, both at European level and at national level through Science Foundation Ireland, we involve farmers, we involve members of the public. I mean, science and entrepreneurship has become more democratized. It's not just the domain of big companies and academics. It involves a large number of other people. And farmers have been amongst the most engaged in that. So I'm actually quite optimistic. I mean, my vision of the farm of the future is that the farmer will actually be a high tech person, somebody who really uh, in, uh, loves tech, maybe has robots mucking out the shed, maybe has sensors deployed in the field, giving you customized fertilizer, maybe has some automated systems, probably has an app to manage their carbon footprint, plant uh, trees or, or hedgerows to capture carbon dioxide and so on. And that provides a rural base for highly educated people who want to run their own tech business in a rural uh, uh, environment and produce food. So I think this is the rebirth of a new kind of uh, farming. I think it's also a rebirth of the rural society. And it's a way of managing what you might call the current uh, technologies and, and education with farming. And that's mm -hmm. where farming was, you know, 100 or 200 years ago. But you know, since mechanization, processes have been quite incremental. I think it's now quite disruptive, like many industries are. So I see fantastic potential, both for farmers of the future who are very engaged, and I think we can overcome all of those challenges, even the fragmented market in Europe, and even the cautious approach to investing. There's such an opportunity, people will go and grab it, and I'm really optimistic about it. That's fantastic, and a great, great note to, to leave us with. And we, I mean, we certainly see it as, uh, you know, both optimistic and it's it's been fascinating listening to both of you. I mean, in terms of what your vision for the future and what you're doing on food, you know, 2030 and also, you know, the EIC's goal in terms of, you know, really investing, accelerating and growing uh, young entrepreneurs. I mean, we're very much feeling that entrepreneurs can solve a lot of these big challenges and you know, and in our experience, farmers are up for the challenge and they always have been. I mean, they're entrepreneurs themselves running their own businesses. And, uh, you know, it's uh, going to be an exciting uh, decade and looking forward to, to working with you on that. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks very much, Sean. Hi, I'm Danny O'Brien, Managing Director of EMEA at SVG Ventures Thrive. As you've heard from some of our guest speakers today, Europe is hard at work with open innovation and sustainability initiatives to advance the future of the agri-food tech sector. Now, this is the part where we transition from hearing about Europe's innovations to seeing what your entrepreneurs are building. I'm honored to be joined by my colleague Evan to help introduce you to our finalists. Hi, I'm Evan Cohen, Accelerator Manager at SVG Ventures Thrive. Danny and I will be helping you get to know our 10 finalists a little better today. These companies are making groundbreaking strides to address several of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and are truly revolutionizing agribusiness across Europe. So without further ado, let's kick off these pitches. Back to Danny to help introduce our first presenter. Testing livestock for the presence of parasites is a slow and arduous process. As a result, farmers typically treat the whole herd without prior testing. This practice of over-medication is creating a global resistance issue. Our next startup from Ireland have developed a kit to help farmers rapidly test and treat only those animals found to be infected. Here to tell you more is Managing Director of Micron Agritech, Daniel Izquierdo. Hey everyone, it's really great to be here today and I can't wait to tell you all about the exciting work that we're doing at Micron Agritech. So I'm Daniel, we're Micron Agritech and let's get right into it. Did you know that parasites are the number one most common health issue in grazing animals worldwide? And that these have a significant impact on both animal yield and feed efficiency. 
But here's the thing, if a farmer or a vet currently want to test their animals for parasites, they need to send samples to a lab, which use a highly traditional and manual process to analyze samples, so results take up to five days to come back. As a result, farmers treat animals without testing because time is their most valuable asset. This is leading to resistance issues. In an Irish study alone last year, resistance was found on 100% of surveyed farms, and these results are reflected in studies globally. It's for this reason that the EU is bringing in legislation this January that will make a prescription mandatory for treating animals with antiparasitic medication. This is going to increase the need for testing, leaving farmers and vets with a slow and outdated system. But we've developed a solution, introducing Micron Kit. Micron Kit allows farmers and vets to test animals for parasites on site using their mobile phone, with analysis of samples completely automated. What does this mean in practical terms for a farmer? Farmers get to save time by receiving rapid and comprehensive results in under an hour compared to five days with a lab, and they get to cut out the hours spent on excessive dosing, increasing overall farm efficiency. They can save money while increasing profit. Like I mentioned earlier, worms decrease feed efficiency and animal productivity, and blanket dosing has been shown to be ineffective up to 40% of the time. So with increased testing, farmers can use the right dose at the right time, increasing animal yield while reducing overheads on medication. Lastly, they can reduce resistance. When resistance happens on farm, it is absolutely devastating, and we're seeing it happen more and more often. With Micron Kit, farmers can take back control of their animal's health while avoiding resistance. So how does this all work? Our cutting edge technology is built on AI. The user's phone begins by taking over 5,000 images of the sample. These images are uploaded to our servers with our, where our machine learning models get to work. They analyze each frame looking for parasite eggs. We provide both a qualitative and quantitative result. So users get a PDF with both what types of parasites were found in the animal and how high the burden of infection is. So what's the business model look like? We're going to be building three key pillars. Number one is direct sales of the kit itself, and we're going to be selling these at an incredibly low profit margin in order to reduce barrier to entry, because we want to make this technology as accessible as possible. Secondly, testing. To conduct testing, vets and farmers will purchase an annual subscription, which gives them access to a specified number of tests per year through the app. This will be the core pillar of revenue. And lastly, Data collected from Micron Kit can be used to create outbreak heat maps and trend data that just simply didn't exist before. This trend data can be sold to regulators and researchers and could be huge in our fight against resistance. Well, a great idea is nothing without a great team. And we have built just that. Our team comprises of 12 ambitious and innovative individuals with a passion for changing things through technology. We've built a multidisciplinary team with expertise from machine learning to business development to product development. And we're at the junction of hardware, science and software at a pivotal moment in the ag industry. We've also got an industry leading advisory board made up, people, made up of people like Nigel Walsh and Andrew Weatherly, who were both ex-directors at Pfizer Animal Health, now Zoesis. So that's what we're doing at Micron AgriTech in a nutshell. And there's only one cute question left. Will you join us in driving the future of animal health through a test then treat methodology using our rapid on-site diagnostics technologies? Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. The global demand for soy is accelerating deforestation around the world. Europe is a significant importer of the product, meaning we need to find alternatives. Soy is the main component of fish feed today, and our next startup, Enna for Bio, is enabling a greener future for fish farming by producing a sustainable, scalable, and cost-competitive alternative. Please welcome co-founder and CEO, Simo Elila. Hi, my name is Simo Elila, and I'm the CEO of Enna for Bio. We are a startup based out of Espoo, Finland, 
and we're in the business of brewing sustainable microprotein. Our product is mainly intended at the rapidly growing aquaculture sector. Most people are aware that the world's oceans are not in great health. Overfishing is a global phenomenon, and we've not been able to catch more fish from the world's oceans in more than three decades. At the same time, the global demand for seafood keeps increasing at a rapid pace. That means that all that new demand needs to be met by a fish farming, or also known as aquaculture. We are already in a situation where more seafood is being produced via farming than what is caught wild from the oceans. That in turn means that more and more feed needs to be provided to farm fish every year. Increasingly, that has come in the form of soy. Unfortunately, soy comes with a lot of environmental baggage, especially if you look at it from a European perspective, where most of our soy comes from South America. There, it is um, very, uh, very strongly linked with deforestation, and it's actually the major cause of deforestation that we Europeans import um, into the European Union. We're tackling this issue with our Pekilo mycoprotein product, a high protein ingredient that is uh, intended as a drop in replacement for soy protein concentrate, which is the current industry standard in the aquafeed um, sector. We're a rather unusual biotech startup in the sense that uh, we have, we're building on more than 50 years of industrial scale legacy. Uh, we have repurposed the so-called Pekilo process, which was developed right here in Finland by the pulp and paper industry, starting in the 1960s and culminating in the construction of two industrial scale production units. These units converted side streams from the pulp and paper industry into sustainable microprotein on an industrial scale, and the product was sold to pigs and poultry in the finished feed market. So it's a validated process and product. At Enter for Bio, we have taken this tried and tested process and brought it to the 21st century. We've tailored it to work with uh, modern, globally relevant side streams, mainly from the bioethanol industry. These side streams are converted into a, an enhanced product compared to the original one. Our product contains more than 65% protein, uh, granting us access to this higher value aquafeed sector. Our founder team is really strong in biotech, which ensures that we keep on improving the process and product as we go forward. But already, our process is able to compete with soy protein uh, concentrate on price. So the aquafeed sector does not need to pay a green premium for using a more sustainable alternative. At the same time, the process makes money. We can uh, pay down the initial plant investment in about four years time. So that puts us in a rather unique position in the rapidly expanding alternative protein space. There are several companies working, uh, converting natural gas into single cell proteins for aquaculture. While that might be economically viable, nobody wants to be feeding salmon with uh, fossil fuels in the long to midterm. On the other hand, there are several startups working uh, with renewable feedstocks but either their raw materials are too expensive or their processes are far too complex uh, to enable them to compete with soy protein on, on price. Now the feed industry recognizes that. Uh, we were the first alternative protein company uh, to win the new Treco Feed Tech Challenge last year. And we're only getting started. We're a very recent startup. We span out from the Technical Research Center of Finland last year, raising 1 million euro seed round we're uh, deep into execution phase at this moment. We're validating our process with the global ethanol industry. And at the same time, we are validating our Pekilo microprotein product with the global aquaculture sector. Um, they are running their salmon feeding trials as we speak. In about a year's time, we um, intend to raise our series A round, which will put us in the position to start implementing our first industrial scale production unit um, here in Europe. Now this is Manhattan, more than 60 square kilometers of land area. That's how much you need in soybean fields to produce the equivalent amount of protein as one of our plants. And our plants have a footprint of 30 by 30 meters. All right, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your attention.
Protecting fresh produce from fungal infection is a major challenge for the food industry. Despite extensive use of unsustainable plastics, $200 billion worth of post-harvest fruit and vegetables is still lost each year. Our next startup, based in Switzerland, have developed a natural coating to protect fresh produce and extend the shelf life of certain products by up to one month. Here's Olga Dubey, co-founder and CEO of AgroSustain. Hello everyone, my name is Olga Dubey. I'm the CEO and co-founder at AgroSustain. At AgroSustain, we are identifying solutions that can fight food waste. When we talk about food waste, we always actually addressing multiple questions in one because food waste is a combination of different issues which are mainly related to reduction of weight loss in fruits, fungal infections, ripening and at the end of the day non-consumable crops. At Dacre Sustain we are trying to develop and bring to market solutions that can address most of these issues in one. And how does it work? I believe the best one is just to see how it work by your own eyes and then judge based on this. So in this video, you can see example. We have a coating solution, which is coming from the mix of natural oils. And you can see that down we have bananas, which were picked up in the shop. And unfortunately, after one week, they started to get black and unconsumable. Whereas on the top, it was the same age of bananas. However, they stayed fresh and yellow for over two weeks. And this is exactly what we're doing. We have to extend the shelf life of fruits, depending on a type of fruit from up to a few days to one month. In addition to, add to it, we also help to reduce the weight loss reduction, which is one of the important challenges, and of course, prolongate the ripening process. To date, we are working with over 15 uh, type of clients, which are either wholesalers, retailers, or producers located in Europe, Switzerland, or also abroad. And our focus is not only bananas, but it's also exotic crops, which experience a long transportation time, such as mangoes, pineapples, or long stored crops, which are locally grown, such as potatoes or apples, as well as high perishable crops. Where do we stay today? Today, we are preparing for commercial launch of our first product, which is natural coating, efficiency of which you've been shown previously. The product will be on the market as of Q1 2022. Afterwards, we would like to come up with a biological coating that will reach the market as of 2024. And later on, the goal is to have integrated solution, which will not only extend the ripening process of fruits, but which will also help to prevent mold development, another very important issue. And this is exactly where AgriSustain is heading towards. So, who we are and how did we manage to come up with all the solutions? So, in brief overview, we've been incorporated in May 2018. To date, we are 12 employees. We have over five patents that help to protect our know-how related to fungicides as well as to natural coatings. And we have a product pipeline that I just show, sh showed to you a few seconds ago. In total, we had raised over 8.5 million Swiss francs. And of course, like any other startups, it's just the beginning and we will do additional fundraisings in the coming months. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Extreme weather events caused by climate change are having a devastating effect on crop output worldwide. Therefore, it's more important than ever to protect what is harvested each year to feed our growing population. Despite farmers' best efforts, post-harvest losses in grain alone amount to $12.5 billion. CBN Agritech, based in Romania, have a solution, and here to tell you more about it is co-founder and CEO Cesar Norescu. Hi, my name is Cesar, and I co-founded with my brother CBN Agritech. As you can well see, we both grew up in a farm. Our grandfather was a silo engineer for 20 years, so this is why we like agriculture and we understand the struggle in the field. Did you know that half of the world food production is wasted? And this is every single year. And out of that, 
20 billion dollars are wasted in the grain industry every year. This is mainly caused by temperature, moisture, and bacteria that are leading to fermentation. And in other situations, hot points appear. And in the right, you can see pictures from a real customer that lost 2 million this year. And in some cases, explosions might appear, causing casualties and huge damages, like you can see. Uh, our customers were looking for a solution like ours, so they paid us in advance to develop it. They provide feedback and they let us test real life scenarios. The root cause of that is because they were using old school solutions and uh, their employees were lacking of knowledge that was leading to lots of human errors. So we are providing a cutting edge tech accessible on any device with automatic data gathering and the most advanced autopilot based on algorithms and data prediction. We also develop and manufacture different electronic devices. So we own the IP, it's a proprietary hardware. Our customers consist in large farmers, traders and processing factories. And we plan to reach them, and we already do that by signing contracts with silo manufacturers. When they are selling silos, they are going to integrate our sensors in the entire system. So our main vision is to cover the entire supply chain, not only the storage facilities, by also providing a system for transportation to provide full traceability from har harvest from the field to the fork. Let's speak about numbers. We already monitor 3 million tons that are worth in half a billion dollars. We do have nice testimonials from corporate customers like Cargill. And with the sales number, we over doubled the sales in the past years. We already have 1 million and 100 in revenue this year, and we are expecting the, a similar growth in the next year while scaling in other countries. In total, there is a huge market of 3.5 billion or even more, and we can address right now 100 million. Our business model is to sell hardware with one off and the software as a service subscription. And as a value, you can consider they're paying less than a dollar per ton. But in the future, we're looking to provide the hardware as a service alternative and pursuing quality certificates to help them sell with higher prices. There are competitors, old ones, established competitors, uh, compared to them, we do have a lot of gathered data from a lot of sensors, so our algorithms are data-based and we do have direct contact with the end user. There are some new entrants, new startups, but compared to them, we have more products. We do have equipment compatible with old sensors, especially with the ones from US. We can change the technology in all systems and we have much more data collected compared to them. This is possible because we have a great team that we worked together in the last 10 years. We had one startup that failed. We sold one startup. We had an exit. And this is the third one. Bogdan, he's a very good Google Cloud expert. Um, Christian, very good engineer in the electronics field. And also Florin, it's a full stack developer. So you can see our full team consisting in sales support and marketing. We got a 1 million investment and looking forward for series A. So thank you very much and looking forward to speak with you. The incredible rise of plant-based protein over the last three years has led to over 32 million tonnes of soy being imported annually to Europe, with a large portion coming from unsustainable sources. Our next startup is harnessing the power of locally grown lupin beans to offer a more sustainable solution for Europe. From Sweden, please welcome founder and CEO of Lupinta, Eslam Salah. Hello everyone. My name is Islam Salah, the founder and the CEO of Lupinta. We are a food 
tech startup with R&D focus to fix the food system for good, using the lupin as our main raw material. We all know the protein shift today for ethical health and environmental reasons. But in Europe, we are importing 32 million tons of soy annually for animal and human consumption. And that causes a massive destruction because it contributes to cutting down rainforest, long distance transportation, and loss of biodiversity. But why do we need to import all this massive amount of soy while we having a local European alternative, which is local? High in protein up to 40%, high in fibers, and low in fat content. When with farming gluten, we're fixing nitrogen to the soil, improve soil texture, good for you and good for the environment. If we see, we can notice that the category leaders globally in meat substitute focusing on soy as the main, the main raw material. But at Lupinta, we are focusing on lupin as the European alternative for soy. With our R&D focus, we are developing flavors and textures to deliver a unique culinary experience for the consumer without compromising the environment or your health. We have developed our first lupin filet. It is a cleaner product fermented based, and we have validated the product in the retail segment. Also, we have developed a pre-seasoned flavored version of it. Also, we didn't stop on the retail. We are also, we have developed burger uh, version of it to be tested in the horeca segment. But we know that flexitarian, they have more demand to have a similar experience to eating meat. So we have developed the first lupin burger. And we are also developing the chicken replacement to be launched, both of them, 2022. We have an amazing team consists of people who has experience over 60 years of, in, in food and food tech including the ex-CEO of Otley, entrepreneurs. And we have within us the experiences and the skill in business development, sales, R&D, and production. Since we started, we have been privileged to get a lot of positive attention. So we have been in the national and international publications, won national and international awards, and being on national TV, but we didn't end that. We didn't stop there. We have been on the streets actually trying and testing our product with the regular consumers. At Malmo Festival, for instance, we sold over 4,000 portions and we got an amazing feedback on the product. And we have been selling thousands of units through our validation period at the retail segment. Now Lupint is ready to take the next step. And we are looking for investors to join our journey. We are looking for $1.8 million to keep the, the, the development of our R&D and put our sales and marketing plan into action. So if you are interested to be in our journey and to support Lubinta, then please contact us. Looking forward to hear from you and thank you for your time and your attention. Well, you know, we have this climate crisis, the climate change all over the world, and uh, this change is related with a lot of uh, challenges, and I would say also business opportunities. And I think the most important uh, aspect is to rethink the business models which we are used to. Yeah, because without the economy, without the business, you will not manage the climate change. The future must come from the entrepreneurs, from people who are very much interested in innovation. And in so far, that's clear to me, it's not only a challenge, it's not only a risk, but it is also a opportunity uh, to create new business models, also to support this world and to support the uh, generations, the upcoming, the next generations to survive on this planet. Well, by in a nutshell, in a few sentences, we were founded in 
1923 by cooperatives, Ralf Eisen cooperatives. So we are really used to live with a special value system which is not only affiliated to the shareholder principle, it's a stakeholder principle. And one of the greatest success over the last 12 years was the foundation of Paiva RE AG, which is a unicorn and uh, one of the leading uh, companies in building and uh, creating uh, wind and solar facilities and power supplies. There are in principle three values, which is the basis for a brand, that's uh, innovation, the solidity from a financial point of view, and the trust in Baiva, in the people, in the employees and in the management, and that meanwhile for nearly 100 years. So innovation is absolutely crucial to survive and also to develop further on our business models and in so far we are very much uh, interested in investing in startups, in new business ideas, in new business models all over the world. And maybe after renewable energy, which is a unicorn, we will find another unicorn in any other sector in the agribusiness. We, we don't have a fund or so. We are always open to invest the appropriate money in new business uh, models and new business ideas. So this uh, GmbH's venture uh, company is sort of the, the vehicle to invest in new ideas. For instance, crop protection on an organic basis, fertilizer on an organic natural basis, or also to invest in new uh, diets, plant-based diets for instance, just to make uh, also the life for people much more healthier as it is right now. We should not fear the future, the future is ahead and we will manage it and the challenge is an opportunity and the opportunity finally will lead us to a brilliant and bright future. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our panel today. I'm Danny O'Brien, Managing Director of EMEA at SVG Ventures Thrive. And I'll be hosting our panel today on decoding European agri-food tech investment, where are the biggest opportunities? I'm delighted to be joined by a great panel of guests today. Firstly, we have Crystal Golan, Senior Venture Manager at Baiwa AG. Crystal joined Baiwa in 2019 and has since been overseen by managing Baiwa's AG's startup collaborations and investments as Senior Venture Manager. She has over 12 years experience as a co-founder of a successful e-commerce startup, senior manager at a rocket internet startup, and a senior consultant in strategy and innovation consulting. Welcome, Crystal. Hello. Secondly, we have Christina Ulardic, partner at Astonor Ventures. Christina is passionate about equal access to food and creating climate resilient societies. She joined Astonor as a partner in 2020, having spent more than a decade working on the ground with agri-food entrepreneurs in Africa, Asia, the Americas, and Europe. Welcome, Christina. Thank you. Pleased to be here. And finally, we have Jens Ingolstadt, Labs Manager at WeWork. Jens works for the Global Innovation Department of WeWork, where he helps startups from the Nordics, Poland, and Russia scale globally and partner with corporates looking to innovate, as well as running two accelerator programs, the Plus Impact Accelerator and the SoftBank Emerge Accelerator. He also invests privately in startups too. So very busy, Jens. Thanks for being here. Thanks and Jens, yeah. uh, Jens I, I might start with you. Um, from an early stage point of view, you meet early stage founders every day uh, who are just getting started. What are some of the hot areas in agri-food tech that the next generation of founders are working on from your point of view? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it demands a long discussion, right? There are so many interesting verticals, but uh, yeah, to name a few, I would say uh, fungi and what's happening with, with mushrooms, it's super interesting. There's a lot uh, to be done. Uh, fermentation, I think is also a space that is uh, super duper interesting what you can do um plant-based uh, fish and, and cheese and, and other alternatives uh, we, we've seen a lot coming obviously with meat but uh, there's a lot happening also uh, in other industries uh, and then everything that is happening with sustainable uh, packaging um, and and shipping logistics everything that has to do um, ar around the actual food itself is quite interesting very interesting and, and crystal turning to you from a corporate perspective what are the verticals you're most interested in? And can you comment on the quality that you're seeing from European deal flow these days? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. So BioHG 
as one of the leading agri-trading and service businesses in Europe is very broad itself. So actually for me, it's easier to say what we don't focus on. Um, for example, we are not in the meat production. But this verticals in ag tech, it also shows the beauty because um, as we are not in the meat production uh, or only with a very limited stake, um, do some feed supply. Yeah, but we do try to become a more and more active player in the alternative protein space. Technologies to develop and produce more sustainable and healthy protein for our growing world population, I think, is one of the biggest challenges in human history, not only for us, but also for us as Viva. And so alternative proteins is one of our two core investment pillars. The second um, investment pillar is alternative crop input. So biostimulants, biofertilizer, biopesticides, we do have a very strong focus on because we want to enable our farmers to fight the climate change and um, the resulting abiotic stress for plants to enable them to plant their um, plants in a nutritious and sustainable well, way, as well as to fight pests um, with uh, a lot of active ingredients, um, yes, getting replaced by regulations. So in general, I think the European startup deal flow is very good, especially in the new egg machinery. But I do think also in biotechnology, we need to become better. Due to regulations, there is less innovation in seed breeding technologies. Most of them are classified as GMO. So I guess Europe is quite limited in developing and enabling innovation in the space. Very, very interesting. A broad area you covered there. Um, Christina, turning to you, you know, the US is, is the leading region for attracting agri-food investments. Um, but initiatives like the Green Deal in Europe will help Europe catch up over the coming years. And as an investor in both markets, what are some verticals you think European startups can really take the lead on? So it's, it's not meant to be a trick question, but it sounds a bit like a trick question because you ask for the lead. So perhaps I can echo a little bit what, what Crystal has said. You know, there is certain market environments that don't make it very um, conducive for a lot of startups to essentially take the lead. So Crystal has managed uh, CRISPR, GMO, but there is also Novel Foods, which is quite a large barrier to jump across. So if you work on a novel ingredient, for example, it is far easier to get the grass uh, self-declaration in the U.S. and start in the U.S. And that comes on top of the U.S. obviously being a large, coherent market and, the U and Europe being a uh, fragmented um, marketplace to capture. So I shy a little bit away from saying there will be a lead or lead verticals that Europe can lead in. I think... Uh, to give it a bit of a positive touch here on this panel too, it is fair to say that there is very good companies that have or that are amongst the leaders currently in Europe. If you, for example, look at an insect out of France, it's certainly a leader in old protein for um, the, the replacement of fish meal. If you look into in-farm as a vertical farming place, you can certainly say it's one of the companies that will make a mark. Um, I think Europe has a good, solid food tradition. Um, there is people who appreciate the clean label. There is people who appreciate the foods. We do see activities as to synthetic biology that was mentioned. Um, can we get faster? Can we get smarter? Can we enable the tech ecosystem that is uh, coming? Um, biologicals has been mentioned. Um, those are all areas to watch. If Europe will take a lead in some of the sub-verticals, depend a little bit on the aspiration of the entrepreneurs and the regulatory environment. Okay, it was re really interesting. Uh, fingers crossed for the future there that uh, things can change uh, for, for the better. Um, Jens, going, going back to you, you know, there's been a lot of investment in Europe over the last few years. It's really accelerated. There's been a number of notable new funds raised over the past year, specifically targeting agri-food tech here in Europe. What's your sense of the current funding environment for startups? You know, are there any gaps that founders find it very hard to, to raise capital at the early stage or later stage? What's your impression of, of working with founders day to day? Yeah, I would say I mean, there are a few positives. There are a few uh, problematic parts as well. Uh, as you said, there, there, there's more money than, than ever before. Uh, so it's very much competitive for VCs to find good deals. Um, 
The problematic part is that even though VCs uh, are, are meant to take risks and, and angels are meant to take risks, I think uh, they, they don't want to take risk and they, they try to mitigate risk as much as possible. So what we see uh, with data as well with statistics in the last uh, 24 months or so is that the number of pre-seed investments is actually going down in, in all industries basically. So you have a lot of investors with a lot of money, they need to deploy it, but they, they don't uh, like to take risks. So it's easier, I would say, to raise uh, Series A and Series B, et cetera. Uh, but pre-seed is, is getting a little bit more complicated. Um, and yeah, so, so we need more early stage uh, VCs and, uh, and the angels to step in early. And um, the problematic part oftentimes also is that it's still difficult for um, founders without the proper networks, uh, underrepresented founders uh, to, to get capital uh, access because they don't have the strong networks. Uh, I would say on the, on the plus side, if we're going to be a little bit positive, uh, the VCs need to deploy the, uh, the capital, right? Uh, so, so there will be a lot of investments and I think round sizes will, will get bigger and quite a lot of them will see that it actually pays off to go a little bit earlier. Um, there's also a large consumer and le legislative push happening as well. So we will see more uh, startups and we will see more investments happening there. Um, and the third and last part is also that COVID uh, actually has helped uh, quite a lot, I think, because VCs can now more easily meet more founders um, and they are not as judged by the geography and, and the backgrounds, etc. as well. So I really hope we will see more early stage investments uh, across the board, all geographies, all kinds of backgrounds of founders as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I definitely see COVID as an accelerant for more international deals over, over the past year or two. Um, Crystal, coming back to you as a as a corporate, um, you know, Biowa has invested in some notable deals this year, such as biotechnology company Amphora out of the US. Besides capital, you know, how can Biowa as a corporate partner with its portfolio companies to help them scale faster across Europe, which can be quite fragmented? Yes, maybe I explain a little bit out of the box what we do in Biwa. But first, I, I would like to comment on Jens that the investments, they are getting more and more mature. And in, also in Europe, the rounds are getting bigger. I think we see that we have seen uh, some big rounds in, in, in Europe, also in Germany, uh, just a few weeks ago with Formo and their 50 million euro round. That was huge um, for, for the German market. And this also means that the egg tech and food tech scene at least to my opinion, is becoming more and more professional. And then in the future, so in the long run, it will be also a more and more interesting um, investment field for all institutional investors, also the later stage in the private equity segments. Um, yes, we as Viver um, are, are a strategic investor, but once we invested in a startup, we follow the rules of venture capital. So... Um, we are in the cap table of Amphora, for example, with a minority stake. And our goal with this investment is to exit profitable in the future. But I guess in the way how to achieve this profitable exit, we are a little bit more flexible. Beside money, I would say we bring a pretty impressive corporate unfair advantage up to the table. We have access to more than 100,000 farmers. Most of them are in Germany, but not all of them. Um, under management, we have an international food, logistic and trading system in place f with our subsidiaries, TNG New Zealand, um, TFC Holland, Worldwide Fruit from the UK. There are just some examples of them. And we do have a test field um, near to Munich with 5,000 parcels in Germany, where we try new crop input, we try new seeds, varieties, but also new services like drone flights or digital soil samples, for example. This unfair advantage, we not only offer the startups the four to five investments we did so far, but also to all startups who want to work and can work with Biber HG. So what do I mean with can work? Um, they need to convince me and my team. And then I approach my internal management network within Biber. And uh, we call this our startup collaboration approach. We don't host the acceleration program for this, but really only a very lean and efficient process to connect the right startup with the right business leader from Biber HG and then guide and help them to exchange first step, then to trials, to do a pilot, to do a POC, always with the goal to realize new business for our operational business, but also to enable the startup and um, providing the market access. 
And yes, uh, Danny, you mentioned we did, for example, this year, three investments so far, but we also enabled collaboration trials, POCs with more than 20 startups and launched new products from startups or become one of their customers using their service or software. Great. Sounds like a, a great opportunity for any startups out there watching this today. Um, and when it comes to, you know, Christina, going back to the theme of sustainability, which is something Europe is really trying to take a lead on here when it comes to uh, climate change and things like that. Um, we often hear about the potential for agri food tech to solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. Can you describe how Astonor Ventures balances a return on investment as an investor and impact as well? Because you know many investors will say it's a trade-off. It's hard to achieve both at the same time. But are there any particular verticals that you see that are that where this is most apparent or can be achieved? So first of all, impact is a very large word, and there is probably not an agreement on what impact actually means. There is certain KPIs that people can agree on. For example, to say, um, let's have a quantitative look at the, carbon, at the carbon footprint, or let's look at the impact on biodiversity, or let's look at nutrition or human health. And, th and those are exactly the guiding principles. I think if you... Um, if you apply certain principles to business models that you support as a part of a selection criteria, you select impactful businesses out of businesses that you are would otherwise be open to invest. So there mustn't be a trade-off if you use that approach. So you're not investing in a company that is impactful because of the impact, but at the same time, you're selecting business models that in addition to being commercially attractive, in addition to being innovative, in addition to being just uh, led by outstanding entrepreneurs with breakthrough ideas, they have a quantifiable KPI as to the areas that I mentioned. And if you do that, um, there is no trade-off um, in my point of view. And then, of course, you have a lot, a lot of cases that are not clear. You have a lot of impact first cases, uh, social uh, cases, or um, certain business models that are really just very difficult um, to put into a VC matrix. And here it becomes very, very tricky because if, just picking an example, if you speak about regenerative agriculture, and if what you mean by regenerative agriculture is actually changing practices, growing different crops, um, uh, again, modifying practices, then the question is, what is the VC play in regenerative agriculture? It can be certain monitoring technologies if regenerative agriculture becomes really popular. It can be funding uh, innovative fintech models, but there is nothing to be said about any exit scenario of farmers changing practices. So here, I think um, we have to be very careful as an industry what is actually um, what can actually be in a VC model and what is impactful and cannot be in a VC model. And I think if we communicate that very clearly and if we are um, walking strictly according to standards, then there will be less of a confusion and less of a misconception that you cannot have an attractive VC play that is impactful. That's, that's great. I think you broke that down R really, really succinctly. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Christina. Um, to end on a, on a positive note here for our international audience who, who may be unfamiliar with, with certain countries in Europe or what's happening, you know, you all probably meet founders every day from all over Europe and internationally as well. But what are some of the key countries that you're really excited about for the next few years when it comes to agri food tech, especially any that are under the, under the radar. Jens, maybe we'll start with, with you from the Nordics. What's your perspective? Uh, what are you seeing that you're really excited about? I'm a bit biased here, but I'm going to say uh, Sweden is interesting. Um, and, and there's a lot of statistics to back that up as well. A uh, lot, lot of stuff happening here. Uh, on top of that, I think Israel, um, always great entrepreneurs coming out of there with, with big ambitions. Um, and then the Baltics, I think Estonia is, is very interesting in all verticals basically just because they are so uh, ahead when it comes to digitalization so there's uh, there's a lot to watch out for coming from from estonia in the coming years that's, that's great thanks what, what about you crystal uh you're based in germany uh are, are you anything besides germany that you're really excited about 
Yes, of course, I'm I'm excited about the German startup deal flow in agtech and food tech, but I also think that the deep biotech um, scene will grow and will be even more interesting than it is right now, especially in Israel um, for for the Europe reach, and then of course in the United States. Um, and but I also think that the Baltic states they they do have their chances, especially in the digital uh, tools and service segment, farm management systems. We see strong development and also strong growth rates there. Yeah, and then let's see, maybe there is a country or I mean the ag tech scene, for example, is compared to other segments very small. So if there is one or two startups, they be, they can be successful in the next next uh, one to three years. Then. Um, they have a bright, brilliant future <laughs> for the whole country. It sounds, sounds great. Christina, last word, word to you. Where do you see potential um, over, over the next few years? I think it's really difficult to pinpoint countries because as Jens said, historically, the Nordics have seen the largest uh, input. But it depends a little bit on the founder and it depends a little bit on the founder's mentality because we did speak about the US and the necessity to eventually look at the US market, capture the US market, and that is in the mindset of the founder. And historically, um, countries that, that have been mentality-wise closer to the Anglo-Saxon model have outperformed. That does say nothing against France and Germany. It's it's just um, historically speaking. So if you have a great founder and he operates or she operates in Norway and says, and you ask, what's your next target? What are you proud of? And they tell you, well, I'm going to capture Finland next year and that's going to be a big feast. Then you're perhaps speaking to the wrong founder in terms of ambition. And I think this is really what counts. Yeah, that's, it's really interesting. It can be hard with so many countries in Europe of, of where to scale. It's something that's held back European companies over the years. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank our, our investment panel today for their insights and all of our speakers, Jens, Crystal and Christina for their great insights. I hope everybody enjoyed the panel and enjoys the rest of the program. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Labor shortages have plagued the agriculture industry for years, and the pandemic has made the problem even worse. In Europe alone, the agriculture workforce is down 23% since 2007. Is now the time for autonomous tractors? The Ag Seed team from the Netherlands believes so. Co-founder Rank Landstraw is here to tell you how it works and show you the future. Hello everybody, my name is Rink Landstra, one of the four co-founders of Exceed. So with Exceed, we believe in sustainable agriculture where farmers are able to optimize productivity while preserving the soil and the environment for now and for future generations. Exceed provides autonomy as a system, a ready-to-use autonomous platform with virtual planning tools and valuable data models. So today's farmers are struggling to find skilled labor while at the same time they are forced to produce much more food. To realize this, machines have become more productive but also heavier, larger, and more complex. Uh, the usage of these machines have compacted our soils, and this is negatively impacting the biodiversity inside the soils and also the ability of plant roots to reach the nutrients in the deeper layers of the soil. To compensate for this, farmers are using chemicals and fertilizer. If we do not put a hold to this, it will inevitably lead to erosion and ultimately to desertification. Our all-in autonomy system is a big part of the solution. To execute this project, we've partnered up with the best-in-class companies to develop an autonomous, lightweight agricultural platform. Our hard and software modules can be combined to realize plug-and-play machines. And our modular approach allows both B2B and B2C revenue streams. Our machine is equipped with a conventional type front and rear hitch to connect with existing implements the farmer already has in use today on their farm. This will facilitate a smooth transition towards autonomy. We do not throw away decades of experience in cultivation of our soils. Our in-house developed digital operator portal is a cloud-based tool to remotely plan tasks and collect fleet and field data. So this unique combination of our autonomous machines in the field and our cloud-based portal is what autonomy as a system means. Our solutions will optimize the business case for the farmer, realizing not only yield increase, but also savings on labor, fuel, and running cost. This will more than double the profit for the farmer while enabling them to work more sustainable. Exceed's core team has over 70 years of experience in commercialization and developing of high volume agricultural machinery for global markets. 
the idea to go back to the basic principles of agriculture was already in the back of our head, in the back of our heads for years. So in 2018, we decided to take this challenge in our own hands. Um, our portal ensures direct communication lines with our customers. So the first machines will be sold directly. We are already contacted now by regional entities to set up partnerships for distribution, and this will ensure rapid growth. The global agricultural market is well over 100 billion US dollars, and the average tractor sales in our target markets reaches 150,000 units. We believe 30% of this volume is up for replacement by autonomous machinery. Within three years, we expect to be able to undercut the pricing of conventional equipment while providing us with a healthy 40% margin. Our initial focus is on arable farming applications due to the repetitive and slow uh, nature of the tasks involved. With the wealth of data that is collected with our machines, we see endless opportunities to be monetized within the food supply chain. Um, Exceed has been able to uh, secure several loans, grants and investments, enabling us to set the foundation for this project. So for now, we're looking for strategic partners for our next Series A round to accelerate our growth and to further expand our data and service-driven revenue streams. So a picture says more than a thousand words, but this one needs a few. This field was underwater, so flooded a week before this picture was taken. The farmer wanted to go on the field to put his sugar beet seeds in because more time in the soil means uh, uh, more time to grow, hence more yield. However, the field was still too wet to go on with his conventional uh, uh, equipment. So he saw our machine on a neighboring field and he asked us if we could have a go. It was no problem with our machine. Secondly, he asked us if we could open up the soil diagonally. So with his conventional equipment, he can only do it left to right or top to bottom. So we just selected one of the diagonal edges as a reference and our path planning tool generated the path accordingly. So also here, no problem. Uh, and as a bonus, we selected the optimal routing on the field. So the shortest route, meaning less time on the field and also less fuel consumption. So we're on the edge of a radical way, a radical change in the way we produce our food. And together with your support, we will bring our solutions to the market, thereby preventing further degradation of our valuable soils, leading to healthier crops and higher yields, and ultimately to provide the farmer with a more profitable business case. On behalf of Team Exceed, thank you. Digital transformation on farms is a difficult and expensive task. Our next startup based in Spain have developed a simple plug and play solution that connects hydraulic and traditional equipment to the cloud. This enables farmers to save money on their water and labour by managing their irrigation remotely. Here to tell you more is founder and CEO of Spherag, Jesus Ibanez. Hello, thank you very much for giving us a chance of uh, introducing you our um, autonomous uh, AI powered uh, automation platform. Today worldwide growers are facing a difficult situation, challenging situation. They need to, to produce more with higher quality standards, they need to monitor but at the same time they have uh, to keep in mind water scarcity, water pricing, energy pricing they also are pushed to use less fertilizers and they need to adapt themselves to a changing uh, weather condition. The way to overcome these challenges is by implementing technology, but in many cases this is not a straightforward uh, movement for them um, since they need to change the way they've been working for many years. In this sense, and after several years in agriculture, we decided to develop and launch a solution which is aimed to be very easy to install plug and play solar powered no need of connectivity and the solution is combining iot and platform services the uh, iot is the gateway for the users to have access to all different services uh, cloud-based such as um, sensors monitoring satellite indexes um, predictive maintenance or uh, crop models and recommendations with uh, nutrition and, and irrigation. This proposal uh, offers the possibility of increasing uh, the production, reducing the fertilizers use, reducing up to 30% water 
usage and savings in installation up to 70 percent and, and also savings in time there is a big market opportunity ahead uh, it's nine million hectares which will need to be automated in the short term and there is uh, another uh, almost 500 million hectares which uh, due to unsustainable irrigation or green water scarcity will have to be automated in the short mid term just to give an idea um, our IoT is able to cover between two and five hectares on average and there's also another vertical which has an interesting uh, growth uh, which is the, the smart water metering and alerts linked to it uh, which is growing at 10% uh, uh, growth yearly and 2.7 billion dollars uh, billion dollars will be spent in in this application in the coming five years the way we want to target the market uh, is by a combination of IOT and, and subscription customers have to pay for the IOT upfront and then there is um, basic or advanced uh, subscription models on a yearly basis depending on which services customers want to, to use during the last year we've been able to deploy devices um, and automate farms in or in eight countries we have uh, over 350 farms automated and monitored with spherac we are now making trials in regions like us australia russia or africa and we expect to keep this this uh, this growth during uh, next year this is um, an image showing the, our footprint we are especially present in countries in europe um, but like I said before, we also have some uh, deployments taking place in other important uh, agricultural regions. We are working with uh, important customers and we have also a special uh, partnership with AWS where we are um, uh, one of the uh, case studies references for them. This um, project is being developed thanks to a team combining uh, business expertise, um, hardware knowledge, um, electronics quite strong in electronics but also software development thanks to the fact that we are able to monitor and create so much data and thanks to the fact that we have everything based in AWS um, cloud we can generate several different uh, services cloud based such as again AI powered um, recommendations machine learning uh, improvement of, of the devices behavior predictive maintenance and so on uh, in this sense, the team is, is growing quite fast uh, in, in this uh, department and well, we are excited about the coming months. This is it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, we'll be pleased to, to talk with you if you have further details or you want to dip more into details. Thank you very much. We're all aware of the need to reduce carbon emissions, and in Europe, there's a growing market for carbon credits. While agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to this problem, farmers often don't know where to start when it comes to reducing their footprint. The team at Carbon Harvesters is setting out to help these farmers and connect them to revenue streams. Please welcome their founder, Alejandro Vergara. Hello everyone, my name is Alejandro Vergara and I am the founder of Carbon Harvesters, an ag tech startup that monitors, reduces and monetizes dairy farms carbon. Did you know that if all of the cattle that is in the world would be in one country of their own, this country would be the third largest pollutant of the world? This is the result of the high environmental impact of this system. Governments and society are noticing this problem and are placing significant environmental pressure over dairy groups who end up facing a triple P problem because they have to face the decarbonization cost on a slow to change industry while at the same time their profit is affected in an already low margin industry. This combined translates into the people since dairy becomes less attractive for new generations and overall decreases the resilience of rural communities. In Carbon Harvesters, we decided to conduct conversations with more than 300 dairy stakeholders all over Europe in order to understand how big of a problem this is for them. We quickly learned from the government that the regulations are only going to increase. From dairy groups, we understood that the lack of carbon footprint monitoring means that they do not know how to decarbonize their sector. And from farmers, we learned that the main pressure point that they are suffering from 
is the environment. Carbon harvesters will listen to these dairy stakeholders and decided to develop a solution in five phase steps. The first one is to monitor the farm emissions that, unlike the current arbitrary carbon footprint monitoring that takes place every 18 months, we are able to do it in a certifiable way every two weeks. We then recommend climate mitigation strategies to the farmer that are both technically and economically feasible to then quantify the effect of those decarbonization strategies and certify those due to our extensive monitoring, reporting and verification standards. This will allow us to monetize the verified emissions reductions outside of the farm, either as a carbon credit or as a market premium. Our unique carbon footprint monitoring is based on importing data from external databases rather than asking from the inputs of the farmer. This allows us to calculate the farm emissions on a frequent in a dynamic way and also in a certifiable one. Some of the inputs that we use are satellite spectrometry. The results are shown to the farmer in a desktop based and a mobile lab platform. But we want to help the farmer to reduce their emissions. That is why we develop a toolbox with a collection of diverse climate mitigation strategies through which the farmer can select. In this case, if Daniel Burns would like to chemically amend his slurry, he can see that he can reduce his emissions by 8%, while at the same time increasing his revenue by $2,400 per year. We then quantify the impact of the mitigation strategies to certify those as a verified emission reduction. Our extensive data collection allows us to work with international partners that monetize these emissions outside of the market, either as a market premium or as a carbon credit. But carbon harvesters is not only limited to dairy. We can also work with beef and with swine farmers, which gives us a total addressable market in the US, New Zealand, Europe, and Israel of $4 billion and a service obtainable market of $105 million. We are confident we can target this market as our holistic approach that measures every single environmental hotspot of the farm allows us to maximize the potential of verified emission reductions, which at the end translates into more revenue for the farmer. We work with dairy groups by helping them to reduce the, their emissions. We then take those negative emissions reductions outside of the farm and monetize them. Most of that money goes back to the dairy group and we take a small share of it. We also have an annual per farm subscription, a finder's fee, and a data monetization plan. We are a group of environmental engineers and ecologists, and we also work with Irish and European Union projects and have international partners that help us cover every single pillar of this business. Until now, we have worked with three farms reducing 810 tons of CO2. We aim to reach 100 farms by the end of this year, with 1,200 the following up one and 5,000 by 2024. We are constantly improving our technology and have secured pre-seed investment. We aim to go for seed investment next year and break even by 2024. This is Carbon Harvesters. People, planet, profit. Muchas gracias for your attention. Our next company is helping food producers measure and monitor the nutritional value of food from seed to plate. Based in the UK, their deep tech hardware and software solution helps indoor and vertical farmers make more data-driven decisions. Please welcome founder and CEO of Garden, Sumanta Talukdar. Hi everyone, I'm Sumanta Talukdar, founder and CEO of Garden. Garden is a phenotyping platform for the entire food supply chain. Now, as a lot of you will know, but for those who don't, phenotyping is the ability to measure plant health and physiology. Now, specifically as represented here in this Venn diagram is the intersection of plant biology, remote sensing, and data sciences. Now, we are a lot more aware today of the food we eat, but again, as a lot of you will know, this is still how we measure quality in commercial operations. And Garden was set up to change this and make food production more affordable and sustainable. Now we're a young company, but we're moving fast. We were only incorporated in January, 2020. Since then, we closed a funding round last year led by a consortium of US and European VCs. We then closed, to be honest, what was an opportunistic convertible note earlier this year. And we've recently been awarded a UK government grant. Now this is a, a full stack company and this is a full stack team. Um, some of these people are people who worked with me before in my previous startup, which exited earlier this year for just over half a billion dollars. And together we bring our combined experience from companies such as Wave Optics, my old startup, Nokia, Intuitive Surgical, Nest, TomTom, and Microsoft. 
And we are partnered with some of the leading researchers in this field, such as Professor Tracy Lawson, who heads the Phenotyping Research Institute and is one of the leading authorities on photosynthetic mechanisms. Now, we like to make things personal, so please be Doug. Doug is head of platform at one of our clients, and he, he has challenges with measuring his product. Industries such as Doug have a problem with measuring quality, reducing variance, reducing operating costs, and increasing yield. And the opportunity for the people who can solve this is huge. Garden is today operating pre-harvest, and from 2023, we intend to penetrate downstream into the food processing market, which is a trillion dollar recurring market. This is when Garden will start becoming a billion dollar company. And now onto our product. So we're a full stack company, i.e. hardware and software. Our hardware is a unique high throughput remote phenotyping sensor. And our software is a cloud-based machine learning and computer vision platform. Now the sensor, the sensor that we were told couldn't be done. This sensor, which is the size of a teacup, incorporates within it plant biology, photonics, computer vision, and embedded systems in less than a hundred dollar package. With features such as 3D scanning, high throughput phenotyping, large working distance, and the ability to directly measure plant physiology in all real world conditions. Actionable insights are delivered by computer vision on edge and a cloud-based machine learning platform. This is an example of how our sensors are measuring photosynthetic efficiency, so clients can make decisions on how to use light more efficiently and effectively. This is an example of our sensors picking up signs of drought stress, in this case, weeks before our clients' RGB cameras and even in-house agronomists spotted it. Now, UX is very important to us. The sensor is plug and play, so clients can install themselves, and we are working very closely with them to understand the most effective means of delivering the insights. Now, I'm now gonna talk a little bit about our business model, market opportunity, exploitation plans, and roadmap. Our business model is SaaS. We will monetize the insights from our sensors on a subscription basis. Our sensors are sticky, as client trials have shown, and once in place, give us an opportunity to provide multiple insights to clients as and when they need them. Our clients love us, and I've got to say, I'm a little bit old fashioned. I like to show that we can do what we say, and that's exactly what we've done. We have a healthy pipeline, and even if we convert half of it, we will generate a million dollars next year. And then just the recurring revenues from the software from that will generate another half a million the following year. Now, market sizing can be done in different ways. Our strategy is to help local food producers gain market share of foods that they can grow, but is currently in the majority imported. We can help them go after this market share by helping them increase value whilst reducing operating costs. And quite interesting to highlight is that with our help, clients can give their crops exactly what they need when they need it. So high value and, and lower operating costs actually go hand in hand. And if we execute well, then our SOM by 2025 will be well over $100 million. This is our 2022 target market. From next year, we will scale across Europe and penetrate North America. We will convert from our current pipeline and put in, put in place regional sales teams supported by growth marketing. Some of you who will have looked for solutions such as this will know this. No one can currently offer an end-to-end -end solution such as this with a SaaS business model. And this is our roadmap for the 18 months starting next year. We will generate a million dollars in revenue. We're targeting verticals of greenhouses and, and vertical farms. We're going to deploy a thousand sensors across Europe and North America, and we're going to start execution for penetrating downstream. Thank you all for your time, and I hope that you found what you saw and heard interesting. Thank you. Controlling weeds is one of the biggest challenges facing crop producers worldwide. The traditional method of broadcast spraying is damaging to the environment, costly to farmers, and leads to herbicide resistance in weeds. Our next startup has developed a selective spraying system that uses AI to identify and target only the weeds in the field, reducing chemical use by up to 90%. Here to tell you more is Nadav Boker, co-founder and CEO of Green Eye Technology. Green is an Israeli-based company with a core mission to dramatically reduce chemical usage in agriculture while increasing productivity and profitability for farmers. And the first challenge we're addressing as a company essentially is weed control in agriculture, which is, as you know very well, one of the greatest challenges for crop production. And to keep it very simple, what we're doing as a company is transitioning from the current practice that is taking place globally 
that we call broadcast spraying, essentially spraying the entire field uniformly, although in many cases, the weed infestation can be as low as 10, 20% to a very precise application. Spray only where it's actually needed with the amount of volume that is required. So when you look at precision spraying, we have quite a holistic approach to this technology, and it sits on four main uh, value propositions. So the first one is enabling farmers to dramatically reduce their chemical input, the volume by 60 to 90%. And that is huge, and we'll, we'll get to the, to the unit economics afterwards. But the second piece, which is, in my opinion, equally as strategic, is to improve weed control efficacy. So in providing farmers with more product that now become affordable to get much better control on their weeds. The third one is the data we collect from the field. So you'll see in a second, our product, we have cameras that are mounted on the boom and we have very robust data collection capabilities. So we don't have to send a drone or a plane. Every time the machine drives through the field, we have massive high resolution data we can collect and provide insights to farmers and stakeholders. And the last one, of course, is the regulatory aspect of pesticides and specifically herbicides, which uh, I think talk speaks a little bit about, about the unique timing of what we are developing. So if we'll get to what we actually built, we build a system that integrates with all type of machines. Our, our main focus is the aftermarket, so retrofitting existing machinery. We are not affected whether it's a, a John Deere uh, sprayer or a case or an Echo or any other machine, we can work with all of them. Here in the picture, you can see uh, the first commercial sprayer we launched just a few weeks ago in Israel. And in a few months, we're gonna have a fleet of machines running commercially in the US. So you can see it's, it's a hardware and software solution. We put our hardware on the boom. So it's cameras across the boom and GPUs. So we don't have, we have no uh, de dependability on connectivity. And then essentially in real time, as the, as the sprayer drive through the field, we can make real time decisions where to spray and where not based on what actually exists in the field. Uh, a few unique features on our system that we work in commercial travel speed of more than 20 kilometers per hour with a core focus of broad acre like corn and soybean. We can work day and night. And I'll leave that to the Q&A, but one of the unique features we have is the dual spraying system. As you can see in the lower picture, we have two lines of nozzles so we can spray multiple herbicides at the same time. So a little bit about technology. So the value proposition of precision spraying is very significant, but at the same time, we don't really see, although it's been a topic of conversation in, in the industry, we don't see this technology being commercialized yet. And the reason for that is, is primarily the maturity of the tech. And here you can see kind of a summary of what we've, uh, what we, uh, a, a field trial we concluded late 2020 with the biggest stakeholders in, in the industry, the biggest crop protection companies, machinery companies, and farmers. And just to keep it very short, we, we have evaluated three aspects of our system, how well the algorithm works in real field conditions, in commercial travel speed, and you can see uh, the accuracy is 95.7, which is extremely high accuracy. The second piece is comparing the efficacy between green eye system to the standard broadcast spraying. Here you can see it's almost the same level of efficacy when we compare apples to apples with the same chemistry. And of course, savings that we bring to the table, which is more than 78% reduction, which is a game changer to farmer from a financial, but also from an environmental uh, perspective to all of us. So this is a little bit about the road for us as a company. I mean, we, this is a super complicated technology. Super excited about the commercial launch we uh, just completed a few weeks ago, but looking ahead to a commercial launch in the US. Um, we'll, we can leave the ROI analysis to, to, to the Q&A session, but I think what I really want to show here is that the focus is corn and soybean is meat to large farmers. And basically, according to you know, this typical use case, we can save more than $100,000 annually for, for our customers, for our farmers. As far as comp our competitive analysis, so we see different approaches in the market. So the first one is companies that are trying to uh, eliminate herbicides, what we call zero herbicides approach through mechanical weeding or electricity or laser. Uh, that can be very valuable for the organic market, less for broad acre. And then there's the infrared technology, which is relevant only for pre-emergence, so not when the crop is in the ground. And then there's the approach of building a machine, and we fall into the fourth approach of retrofitting existing machinery. So this is the core focus of what we built, a system that can work with all types of machineries. The core focus for us is a commercial launch in 2022 in the US. We already have dozens of signed contracts with farmers in Iowa, Nebraska, and Illinois. We're gonna have a fleet of machines working there. So I think this is a, you know, a, an inflection point for the company positioning ourselves as the first company to launch this technology commercially uh, for corn and soybean. Um, just gonna go through it. One few topics I do wanna emphasize is we starting with, with optimizing the way herbicides are being applied, but ultimately the value proposition and, and value expansion of this technology is far greater. So it's, it's optimized the way fungicide and, and micronutrients are being fertilized as well. And also 
um, about the, the data that we can collect and monetize from the field. So I think it's really just the beginning of the potential of this initial application around herbicides, but the story and the greater vision is much, much broader than this. Um, we raised $7 million to date, uh, le led by some of the largest VCs uh, and strategic like Syngenta. Uh, we are now, a few weeks ago, we launched a $20 million round. Um, almost 50% of it actually is already secured, again, with participation of new strategic from the machinery side, as well as all of the existing investors. And we expect to close this round in the next four weeks or so. So there's quite a lot of interest. And we do see this round becoming oversubscribed quite, quite quickly. And just the last slide about the team, uh, we are 25 people in the company today. We, I built the company with my two co-founders. We've been serving together uh, in the Israeli Special Forces, uh, working together for almost two decades. So it's a very diverse group of people with very different skill sets, data scientists, mechanical engineers, agronomists, working together uh, for, for almost two decades to kind of solve this very, very important task. Thank you and well done to all 10 finalists. As a reminder, we have three awards to announce today. Our People's Choice Award, the Female Founder Award, and the overall Thrive Europe Challenge winner. Our Thrive team and judges convened prior to today's event to meet the startups and review their pitches that you saw today, and I'm honored to announce the winners. For the People's Choice Award, the global agri-food tech community have cast over 1,000 votes for their favorite European startup. And the winner is Lupinta. Harnessing the power of lupin beans, this Swedish company is offering locally grown, healthy and sustainable alternative protein that is capturing support from all over. Congratulations to Eslam and the Lupinta team. Next, from our total applicant pool, we had dozens of startups applied that are led by women but one leader in particular stood out from the rest. And recognizing contributions of inspirational women, we hope to move the dial in creating a more diverse and inclusive tech industry. I'm honored to present the Female Founder Award to Olga Dubey, co-founder and CEO of AgroSustain. Olga and her team are using biological plant protection to reduce food waste and support organic food production. Our team was inspired by her achievements and contributions to the agri-food industry. Congrats, Alga. And now for the main award of the day, evaluated based on their team, technology, traction, and more. The Thrive Europe Challenge Award goes to GreenEye. This Israeli company has developed a selective spraying system that uses AI to reduce chemical use by 90%, a prime example of doing more with less. Congratulations to all our winners and a spectacular job by all our finalists. Finally, I'd like to say a special thank you to our headline partner, ICL Planet Startup Hub, and to our partners, judges, mentors, and our team for making this event possible. And thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you at the Thrive LATAM Challenge on December 2nd. Until then, stay safe, and let's continue to advance the future of food and agriculture through innovation. <music>